sponsor of this event. And um, so I'd like to welcome you to the college lecture series. Uh, today, Dr. Kathleen McCoy will present a talk titled Irish and Other Explorations of Identity, Identities in Poetry and Art. She'll share a brief narrative with photos and poetry from her recent sabbatical project as Professor John Hampshire interprets by painting live for the audience. Some background on our presenters. Dr. McCoy is a professor of English at SUNY Adirondack. She started at the college in 1995. She's a native of Ohio and earned her master's degree and PhD in modern literature and poetry from the University of Missouri. She's written two books and a chapbook in recent years and presented at numerous conferences. She blogs and tweets regularly. She's earned many fellowships and awards for her poetry. So many I've said not to read more, so a lot of them. <laughs> uh, she's won President's Award for Excellence in Teaching, Senior Faculty, and the 2017 Chancellor's Award for Scholarship and Creative Activities. Uh, she lives in Queensbury, and she recently returned from Ireland and Northern Ireland, where she studied issues of identity in ancient and modern Ireland and Northern Ireland, including the bog bodies, how fun, or bog-preserved mummies of prehistoric Ireland. Our other presenter, John Hampshire, is a professor of fine art at SUNY Adirondack and has been here since 2005. He's a native of Chicago and received a Bachelor of Science in Art from Skidmore College and a Master's of Fine Arts degree from SUNY Albany in 1997. He earned the Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Scholarship and Creativity, a New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship grant, and the Purchase Award from the Hyde Museums. John has dozens of solo and group exhibits uh, nationally, including in New York City, Florida, Rhode Island, Maryland, and many other places. His work has been covered in the New York Times, Art Voices Magazine, uh, as well as a television interview on PBS. John lives and maintains a studio in the Church. Yeah, I do. Okay, whatever, here, take over. Thank you so much. Oops. a little bit about what I'm going to be doing. So we kind of have a vague idea when we initiated dialogue about this. And when we met, we kind of talked about a montage of faces. Uh, and these are based on photographs that Kathy took when she was, I, I'm assuming all of them are from Ireland when we were abroad. Not many yeah. of them are. Um, so what you'll see is most likely a start. I don't think I'm going to get a full montage in our time. But you'll get a sense or a flavor for where this, this will go. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, John, for agreeing to do this. I'm so excited. <laughs> We've never done anything like this here, so I'm just excited. If I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. That's a quote from Audre Lorde. <laughs> You have to start with Audrey Lloyd when you're talking about identity. Um, so I did a uh, sabbatical on identity and poetics, um, not in the sense of naming, labeling for the purposes of whoops for the purposes of excluding or uh, making others feel other. But the idea of the philosophical other with the capital O interrogating that in post-structuralist sense, which asks us to continually revisit, re-examine, redefine, and reinterpret a whole complex, complex of identities that each of us has and that we see and that we try to interpret in art. And art does so well. And I can't wait to see what John's going to come up with. Um, so by entity, of course, identity, of course, we mean a whole nexus of ideas like <coughs> ethnicity, gender, sexuality, uh, geographical, political borders, linguistic borders, uh, educational borders, class borders, um, artistic borders, sexual and religious identities. Um, another thing that, that Lord said that I wanted to quote before I, I get onto the reading was, I want this book to be filled with shards of light. Um, that's a lofty goal, but that's my goal. And please be kind as you listen, because 
these are poems in process. <laughs> they are, they've been um, in generation, uh, generation and regeneration, um, composition and revision for about a year. So I don't think that they're done, done. Um, so I, you know, the vice president very politely asked me if he could get a copy of my sabbatical book, <laughs> and I said, well, if and when it comes out, I will get you one. <laughs> this is the book that came out this summer, Ringing the Changes, and I am not going to read from it <laughs> because it's not really on the theme of identity, so to stay with what we're doing. I thought I'd just talk about my travels and some poems that arose from that. Can you see this? I mean, I am obviously a white gal from the Midwest, imported to New York, so what do I know about complications of identity? But this is one century old, which means when my grandmother was a girl, her family saw this sign posted, help wanted Irish need not apply. <laughs> So um, in some ways, I think all of us are touched by um, limitations and expansions and, and possibilities of identity that we have to keep interrogating. So this first slide is just a humorous moment <laughs> from the Kingship uh, and Sacrifice exhibit at the National Museum of Archaeology in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, where Professor Eamon, they call him Ned Kelly. Um, yeah, I almost got to meet him, but not quite. We were just corresponding by email. Um, but he put together this exhibit as the lead researcher of uh, natural bog mummies found. They're found all over Northern Europe, as you may know. Uh, but they're coming to light more and more frequently, uh, partly because of climate change and partly because we continue to mine the earth in those regions for peat, for fuel. Uh, they still burn peat in some uh, places in the country in Ireland. Um, so most of these are Iron Age mummies that they believe were naturally preserved by the tannins in the bogs, in the wetlands. Um, so the tannins can do an even number of, th the as acidity, very high acidity, and anaerobic environment, no oxygen, um, can do a number of different things depending on how it reacts to the body. So some bodies like this one come out highly skeletonized with very little flesh and don't really seem all that human and more, seem more like something you see in the corner of the bio lab <laughs> for the bones of the body, but uh, some you'll see a little later look very human and make us think about who is other. Most of these bog mummies from Ireland were kings, or were supposed, are supposed now by anthropological expertise uh, and examination and re-examination and conference internationally to be kings who were sacrificed because their lands became infertile um, when there was drought or the uh, climate went sour for a few years and there wasn't enough food it was understood that the king, who had symbolically married the fertility goddess to gain his stature, would be taken to a bog at a borderland between kingdoms, and usually very close to a hill where he would have been uh, dubbed the king of his kingdom of Ireland and sacrificed. Sometimes it's quite brutal with um, actual mutilation of the nipples, symbolically meaning Okay, you're cut off. <laughs> uh, you, you're not, you're not uh, with the fertility goddess anymore. And uh, strangulation and all kinds of other gory things, but we'll move on. <laughs> uh, just quickly, um, there's a slide uh, about the art of the troubles here from the Ulster Museum. Um, as you may know, um, Ireland and Northern Ireland are waiting with bated breath about the outcome of Brexit. So it's very much a country of borders geopolitical and uh, religious borders that mean economics, jobs, family, separation, um, trade. It means everything to the people that we not have a hard border between the North and the Republic. 
Um, but the Ulster Museum has a wonderful exhibit there on the, the Troubles in Ireland, which was the time of civil war, really, where the Irish Republican Army from the uh, south was going up north and bombing. Uh, and it wasn't one-sided, really. It was, it was both sides, lots of violence. And this is a quick mural from the famous Peace Walls of Belfast and Derry, where the murals are continually being updated um, on those borders between Catholic and Protestant communities. I'm going to start with a poem called Aliens. It's a simple little poem, uh, and it's a dream poem, but it introduces the theme, and it's a literal dream I had as I was preparing to go to Ireland, so I think that'll make sense as I get to it. The dirt path of a dream, stacked with stones between us and the sea, feels soft and dry beneath our sandals, trips us up occasionally with quasi-hidden rocks. Customs inspectors stomp us, their office a literal cave. We unpack stack after stack of sweaters, socks, bags of mostly needed things that never go back in as neatly as they went, go back as neatly as they went in. A hip high boy runs up to me, so happy he wraps his arm around my leg. His parents smile with outstretched hands and quizzical welcomes for odd visitors. Across the boy's cheeks, trails of green glitter glimmer in a shaft of light. Aliens, I hear him say, knowing we are they. And this is just a portrait of Seamus Haney, the great Irish uh, poet who just died a couple years ago. Um, I, I, I kid, my, my joke with uh, Marilyn is, thank you Marilyn, is running the slideshow for me. She's part of my writer's group. Um, a key mentor for me, and um, another mentor is sitting right here, David Graham. And, uh, I joked with them that Seamus Haney continually looked over my shoulder when I was in Belfast. <laughs> and throughout Ireland, even when I was in Dublin, I would finally sit down and try to take a load off my knees and my feet for a few minutes. And I would look up and there would be another portrait of Seamus Haney. <laughs> so he was following me. I hope approvingly. One, one never knows. So the next um, bit is in Ireland, a poet. And the title is the first line. In Ireland, a poet inhabits or is possessed by surf whose foam cascades, then decrescendos. The sod with its secret musk of decay, richness teeming with squirming worms, the wafting scent of lilacs she didn't plant that bloom each year anyway, the crossword she wishes she'd never uttered or heard or swallowed, Awkward silences post tears and the tears and the cause of tears. The useless things she makes that taste like mango chutney or sound like harvests and woodlarks brief duet. Moving to the mummies, um, I thought, I, part of my travel, uh, this middle portrait uh, attached to the canvas here. Oh, that's what we're starting with. Okay, this is Scott Cairns, a great uh, spiritual poet and uh, the leader of a workshop I took in Santa Fe in August, in July, I guess, late July, early August. And um, he, he has a Greek-American face. Uh, so he's, he's another identity person. Um, but I decided at that time that what I needed to do for this next book in progress was to do some American poems alongside some Irish poems because I was finding so much of my plumbing of my own identity and, and things that mean so much to me, places and people would have to be half American and, and half Irish. 
So um, I thought I would do that with the mummies as well. And I found out, thanks to Val Haskins, about a couple of American uh, mummies as well. This is Fawn Hoof, um, the name that was given to an, a Native American mummy, naturally mummified in a salt cave, in mammoth caves in Kentucky. Uh, she was called Fawn Hoof because she must have been a medicine woman. And there were literally fawn hooves on her necklace and some other be red beads that probably caused abortion, as you'll hear in the uh, poem. So this is Fawn Hoof, 500 BC to 1 AD, found in Short Cave of Mammoth Caves, Kentucky, circa 1811, exhibited at two world's fairs, lost, found, and now at the Smithsonian. This is a Terza Rima, so it's a three-line uh, form structure um, with first and third lining, it's rhyming, and then the second line becomes the dominant, and the next, and so forth, and then it ends. <coughs> uh, anytime you want it to end, <laughs> and with or without a Terza. However you learned to handle the hawk, your hands worked sage gentle at spirit talk. Cane flutes whistled, sounding sure. Intractable Cooper's hawks would glide, their teardrop shapes of poor feather veins painted, sewn astride your brown leather luster cape. Your kinsmen's pride entrances us. Their gift, strange neck drape of fawn's hooves, and the seeds around your small nape to celebrate the red mystery of deeds kept secret. How a womb contracts. How a girl doesn't need to give her seedling room to grow if disease or violation be her only groom. Your calm belies the unease you must have felt at times without a breeze and the swelling stench of welts as you stitch the bloody ooze more cleanly than the tanner stitched a belt. Your people's meticulous fiber shoes left prints round and round in circle dance, more clues to how your people found reasons to look up high from the familiar ground. Hawks circle above stalactite studded cave sky where you were sat upright to die. The next one, you'll see some pictures. Um, these, uh, the hand and the, sorry, flattened by earth, face, uh, have been reconstructed to show what this man probably looked like. This is Cloney Cabin Man who was found in the borderlands, uh, uh, what is now um, North uh, Eastern Republic of Ireland, um, and, and just south of the border to Northern Ireland, Cloney Cabin Man. And the poem is Cloney Cabin Man, County Neath. And, and the Irish pronounce the TH with a ta, so it would sound like County Neath. 392 to 201 BC, found by Pete Cutters and now on display at the National Archaeology uh, Museum of Ireland in Dublin. What the sight of you does, I cannot tell. It is almost as if I were your wife, companion Celt of little import, more your cur than half a royal pair. There you lie. Though I was sure that I could see you through the snare of cruel snarl bog, the tanned flesh but saved your gelled hair. Memories of a passionate hug dissolved like bone, steeped in tannic acid in the fog of years, query like a hard carved room beside your glass prison. I can't leave the curl of your fiddlehead ear, nor drown myself like they did you, nor retrieve your cut-off hand 
but wonder what you may have believed in County Meath's fog beneath the yew, how it felt as the land swallowed you. But the reference to the gelled hair, if, can we go back to that picture for a second? Thanks, Melissa. Um, the reference to the gelled hair, he had this elaborate hairdo that they were, because it was mostly in, intact, it was just smashed. Um, uh, the, it was put together with tree rosins imported from Spain. So we know that this was a, a princely person. And the next pictures we have are, this is a picture of the Hagabera. <laughs> the last trip, I went to Ireland twice. I went in February uh, and early March um, all over the place. <laughs> down south for research on the mummies and up north for a conference in Belfast. Um, and then I went again in late August to a writer's retreat at, called Ankara, which means soul friend. And um, one of the local features of this area is that rock called the Hag of Vera. And there's a, a local legend that there was this hag, this old woman that I'm gonna call a crone, which implies more wisdom than judgment. I think, um, who was looking for her sailor husband right there, because right, what you don't see in that close-up of the rock is the sea, it's just downhill from where, where it is. Um, there's also a, a folklore that she, from that area, had stolen a, you know, they were always looking for ways to call women witches, right? So that she had, uh, she had stolen a prayer book from the local cleric, and she, you know, she should suffer for that. So I play with that idea in, in the poem a little bit. And this is the very big Irish name that I can't pronounce for that <laughs> reconstruction of that particular Celtic cross. Um, the Celts used uh, syncretism. You know, they syncretized. They brought in uh, or adapted, really, um, pa pagan customs and sites that were sacred to pre-Christians and adapted them to Christianity. So the, the circle would represent sun worship, uh, and here it's, it's just more or less a halo around the cross of the risen Christ. The Crone of Pharaoh. Having donned a wrinkled dress, she ambles out among striated stones above the strand, a pen between her teeth ache of absence between her legs and watches for her love across the sea. Now that day has at last materialized from bones and feathers, fire and mist. She prays that she will see her man beyond the white caps. The wind lets fly her hair, unwraps her shoulders, rips up the wild sting of sea salt spring. The black-headed gull tells her winter's near. Only priests hear her. Little dogs find her, fall at her feet, belly up for a rub. Cows that tend to scamper come to her, unbidden. Horses rub their great faces on her. She rejects all notions of a mournful hag. Her back is strong. Her voice gives waves the shivers, and she doesn't care about the gray of her hair, though once it was black as the raven. When the sky is clear here over Vera, she can fly a kite or choose to sing with her tambourine or else to croon with the crones. No one ever told you the truth of her. Even when she's by herself, she's never alone. She might walk off with your book of prayers, but she'll always bring it back again with new ones scribed in back. She has to take the words to mouth. She says they taste like consecrated wine. Um, the next portrait you see is Mav McGuckian. Uh, the paper I wrote for Belfast uh, was half about Mav McGuckian's latest book. Um, She's known to be a really um, intense, deep, private poet, but her writing is astounding. 
You can watch it evolve over years, like we're watching this painting materialize as we sit here. Um, and I thought it would be a good introduction to the next poem, Deidre's Song, Deirdre from Irish Myth, um, and associated with mourn, mourning and with poetry. <clears throat> Song robin feathers drop and mass in empty blue shell from nest of grass as slices of sunray somehow harness generous dollops of walloped darkness. Tracks of deer hooves shadow snow like shining eyes, I think I know. A penchant for wood, bread, ohm, no use for moans. Straight supple, supple backbone. Waking nightmares of collapse my men will ignore, forego, trespass. Weight of, weight of fairy, cry of banshee, heart for the disheartened refugee, disquiet of the shot in its den. Coals burn red in the heart of a woman. The uh, OM, you might know, O-G-H-A-M, that strange word, that's the original prehistoric uh, writing of the Irish. It's just lines carved in straight lines. And this is a picture of a green man uh, these are icons you find. <laughs> these are icons you find all over um, Europe, actually. Um, little faces hidden in foliage in the woods, um, and then they they found their ways into um, early churches in Europe and throughout Ireland, um, possibly because this was another way of syncretizing the pagans' belief in in some sort of natural deity watching over us. Um, so I'm transforming that mythic idea in the next poem called Green Women for my daughter, <clears throat> who hasn't heard this yet. You have to tell me what she's going to say, Bob. I have no idea. <laughs> Green Women. Uh, and, and there's references to a couple of miscarriages I had. Uh, I keep dreaming about these two little kids and they wrap themselves around my legs and it's, they're always happy dreams. They're very, very happy dreams. Daughter, when your days were green and you tired of teaching dolls and reading, you used to saunter to the backyard, prop your back against the hemlock, tell it all your thoughts. Dubbed your thinking tree, it didn't seem to mind. It had your back, combed your head, tarred your hands, needled your thoughts, spread fallen laces on the ground to offer their soft bed for drawing, pondering clouds. Now the thinking tree has gone to the great forest underground, and you, thinking girl, have moved to deeper woods. I stand where you sat, traips among the t trees, not far away, and thinking of the green man who hides, watching from oaks and maples, witness the great diminishment of woods. Pines go bald in their upper thirds, limbs sharpen brown swords, songs of thrush and robin thin with time. In my sleep, your never-born siblings wrap themselves tightly around my legs. They huddle, shivering slightly in these woods, the thin place where their knee-high, wraith-like bodies materialize in marsh mist. Their arms, branches, their hands, sap, feet, roots, faces, moons, their eyes, stars, their grasp, strokes of lightning. I am the tree they wanted to climb, the limb from which they'd one day spring to flight. I had no idea a mother's body could grow soot in womb's wet nest, that the cord could siphon soot into fetal bellies, blacken their bright eyes. Here among the trees, let's sprout green leaves for hair, absorb balsam scent, our legs turning brown in the shade, our arms green, and for the babies who never breathed, we shall become green women watching the woods. 
that sifting is actually from a news article I read just a, about a month ago. It was really shocking, but there was actually a recent study that showed, I can't remember what country it was. I'm sorry I didn't print this out because I can't readily cite it, but there was a recent study and there was some country somewhere <laughs> where, where uh, uh, miscarried babies were studied and the mothers were studied to uh, see what we could learn about fertility. And there was actually air pollution in the womb of babies that died uh, before birth now. This is a Todd Paxton sculpture. I happened, he's a very well-known artist in New Mexico, and um, a new friend from this writing workshop and I just happened upon him live sculpting in an art gallery in downtown Santa Fe. And his work uh, relies heavily on native imagery. And um, I don't think he is native, but he, he gives homage to the roots of the place he calls home. The next one shows um, some of the cliff dwellings that we explored. That's OK. That's OK. There you go. The cliff dwellings we explored on our day off there. Um, you can see the cairns, like the Irish have, the stacks of stones. Um, so the, and and I, I, after talking to Joy Harjo and, and reading a little bit about um, uh, Native Americans and Irish, I learned that you know some of those legends of intermarriages are true. Um, some of us probably have both Native and Irish blood. And there's some interesting correspondences in the way they see the world. The next slide is a woman I met on the bus in Santa Fe. I, I talked to her for the 10 minutes before she got off the bus. And she seemed almost homeless, except she had a beautiful little Starbucks bag with her. <laughs> so she'd been shopping and having her Starbucks. Um, and uh, she's clearly a native woman. And she was reciting the entire history of Santa Fe. It was astounding. Um, so I gave her a name, because I couldn't hear her over the roar of the bus. Um, but Dolly means, or Dolly, I guess, means sorrow, I think, in, in Navajo. Dolly of old Santa Fe. Everybody knows her. 90-something Navajo who rides the free shuttle gets off for ice cream and back on every day in the same gray sweatshirt, wrinkled wranglers, weathered face multifolded, dark and bright at once. Nose slim and regal, she regales us with stories of old Santa Fe, the trail, the rail, the museums, the shops before the shops, before the shops we see as we go by, the people before her parents and those of the people passing by. Her waist-length steel gray ponytail wrapped in faded strip. She's used to being passed by. She likes the buses cool. Her eyes gather shine as subtly as day becomes noon. She points out the sights on El Camino Real, the Sangre de Cristos, San Miguel. She hangs her head gathers her crinkled Starbucks bag with its brown goddess. And as we halt, she rises, waves, strides off, trailing a faint, ancient wisp of juniper in the bone dry air. Her life may or may not be what John the driver says after she gets off, that though she's the richest lady he knows, she lives by candlelight. It's from cans in a house on a street of multi-million dollar homes. Last whole route of old Santa Fe, refusing to sell out for comfort in her later years, for money to pass to her kids. Oh, Dolly, I want to hold, hand you secret gems, my notebook and my pen, but not for free. Nothing you've ever had was free. I want the air around your bed to cool in moonlight. And when your family rides in again, for the meat to be hot, the flatbread good, 
your dreams ascending in curls on the smoke. I want your story so I can give it back to you. I want your forgiveness for this poem. I want to know tonight you'll light an extra candle. next one is, there's this amazing uh, tapestry in Belfast at the Ulster Museum, um, the Game of Thrones tapestry. Any Game of Thrones fans? One. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I didn't watch it. I tried like three times and I couldn't get past the first minute because there was blood and gore every time I turned it on. But, uh, <laughs> the, the <laughs> but, but the, uh, the, there was a tapestry commissioned by the one of, the, one of the arts councils, I imagine, that it's housed here at this museum. And it wraps from one wall around to the other wall and to another and another. I think there were five walls. It was still in process when I was there because Game of Thrones wasn't quite finished. But they allowed you to take pictures of the tapestry. And uh, I picked some frames that just seemed really salient. A girl has no name. Because Dolly, who I just wrote about, really, I don't know her name. And the next one, I'm going to share with you also. It's a woman, I had to make a name for her because I don't know her name. So the next one is this young woman here. I took the photograph with her permission um, on the streets of Dublin. Very neat, beautiful handwriting. This art all around her in chalk um, of words. And, I didn't know what to do, so I wrote a poem. It's one of those. <laughs> so Dolly's other half is, is Molly. In the gray downtown Dublin rain, I stopped cold when I saw her gray eyes, gray sweatshirt under gray drizzled skies, like a magpie flown onto the pedestrian mall, flash before a storm pours down. In a magic circle of her making, Neat chalk word messages in yellow, pink, blue, green. Hi, I'm Molly, ready to work, not lazy. I have no one to ask for help, please. Please help me, God bless you. Help me, God bless you. She at last looked up to see me watching her, trying to see her, trying to see past her cross-legged slump Long, messy bun, lines in her face too deeply etched for one so young. Whatever pain I thought I knew melted on the pavement at Molly's feet. On this broad avenue of posh stores where trash is whisked away, where most hurry past to reach sweet smelling destinations, our eyes met. I don't understand what they saw, but it was worth seeing. That's all I know. I asked if I could take her photograph, thanked her for her yes, her God bless, as I gave a couple coins, but not my coat, not lunch, not conversation. Dublin whispered prayers for Molly to be housed, fed, safe. Seen. not belonging there in the first place. Still, I'll return this winter, hoping to find on that clean swept spot, no young lady, no one buried there under sightless glances. Molly, I can't know what fates landed you alone, cup of sadness overflowing, your paper cup braced against wind by just a few euros. But may your so stout heart keep beating silent time to the cadence of all our feet that pass you by each day. And then we get some landscapes. <laughs> I, can't, I can't write about identity without writing about place. I'm a farm girl and I just, there's, there's dirt in my veins. So um, some of these vistas, you didn't have to go very far to find amazing angles and amazing sights 
past sites, within sites, framed by sites. <laughs> um, shored up, falling apart, etched thousands of years ago. New things and old things. This is New Grange. This is the famous Neolithic tomb. And these are called, uh, they're called tree skills. I have trouble remembering because I want, they look like they should be short vowels, but they're long, long. And then the next slide, um, I didn't, these are things I haven't written about yet, <laughs> but I need to. This is from the last um, stop at Anamkara, the writer's retreat in southwestern Ireland. So the other side of everything from Belfast and Dublin to Toronto East, um, very near the Atlantic. Um, uh, and these are some, some of the many standing stones. They're literally in farmer's fields, so you can uh, <laughs> walk across to them because the government has made agreements with all the farmers except one. We couldn't see the, we, we couldn't walk up to the ogham that we own that we saw st standing stone that had own writing on it because that farmer hadn't agreed that anybody <laughs> could traipse over his wetlands. But this was wetlands, I promise you, because I sank up to my knee trying to get there. I thought it was all safe. It looks solid, but when they say the bogs, watch out for the bogs, they're not kidding. I should have thought twice because all the cows in that pasture were on the hill. <laughs> but there were other tourists over there at the Standing Stone, so I figured, well, they were fine. I don't weigh more than they do, but I put my foot in the wrong place once. Um, I have to thank the Reverend Dr. Don Schuler, who's right here, over here, um, for telling me about thin places and that whole concept, and then reading about it in Anamkara, the book by John Donahue, and, and lots of other places, this Celtic idea, pre-Christian idea, really, that there are certain landscapes, certain geographical places that are sacred, um, whether by geomagnetism or by spiritual energy or whatever it is, but places where people have claimed to feel closer to divine energy. So I just wrote a sort of homage to the many thin places. Where spirit whispers reach the ears, sleeves blow the hair, where the ground records all footprints and oaks record each touch, where vegetation turns to bog and never rots, where butter tastes good for a hundred years, where black oak stumps emerge after thousands of years, where saints sin and sinners seem saintly, where ghosts gather and wishes matter, where iron sludge and bog mud converge, where sod grass and marble rocks inflame the fallen knees, where salt air and sun streaks shimmer in the eyes, where I long for lost family and find my shadowed self, where the dead look down on the living and the living look up to the dead, where breathing people turn on myth and chimeras turn to stone in mist, where the king's sacrifices lie, bodies rising with the peat to meet their severed limbs, where cloven hooves plow harrows in the mud where water meets the land <clears throat> and skin tingles with earth energy where I become somehow another refugee where leaders borders loom with danger where the traveler learns to keep some trust for the next kingdom to come. And the next one is just my shadow on a trail <laughs> for that shadowed self. And then the next one is just a fun little, this is a statue at Queen's <coughs> University Belfast of this striking, enormous, larger than life, marble statue of this thinking man. And I, I talked to my new Irish friend and I said, wow, what an amazing sculpture of Galileo. And she said, where? And I, I said, well, right, right there. And she said, how do you know that's Galileo? And I said, well, it 
it says so right there. <laughs> so she was amazed that she had been there for years and had missed that she was walking past Galileo every day. Um, so I, I was playing with words on Galileo. <laughs> Um, so Galileo sulks in marble, jaw in hand, his mind on Jupiter, the church his millstone. And the next is um, just proof again that, you know, this man was following me. I may, I, if he weren't dead, I would be looking for a policeman, but <laughs> I don't need an order of protection. I, he's become my muse. And there was a quote from him when I went to Poetry Ireland to a book reading. Um, uh, this is getting cooler and cooler over here, warmer and warmer. Um, that there's a quote from Seamus Haney. I'm not sure if you can see it, so I'll read it. It says, I rhyme to see myself to set the darkness echoing. Seamus Haney from Personal Pelican. And that's really pretty much it. The rest are pictures. So this is JFK. <laughs> I thought there's a great identity shot. Just aim it at the, the customs line at JFK. <laughs> there's this marvelous mural above us all. And we were in this line that the, the signs were promising would be 15 minutes. That took an hour and 45 minutes. But, it was <coughs> um, but just everybody, helping everybody out. There were little kids screaming. and old men trying to make it, and everybody just was very kind, and, and it was a beautiful thing to be there, even though I hurt. <laughs> it didn't matter, everybody around me hurt too. <laughs> and then I gotta show you the next picture. The, uh, whoops, okay, one more. Okay, yeah, I, I went to a cafe, and there were, there were clocks in every cafe. They had they liked having collections of clocks, it seemed. And this one was striking because an entire wall was clocks with a grandfather clock in the middle. And you notice the time, right? No. <laughs> there isn't one with the right time on it. They all have different times. So I wanted to tell all my friends there must be a genetic reason why I am time challenged. <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs> Did you have any questions or comments? And then I'll give the mic over to this expert over here. That is amazing. It went by very quickly. Well, I got into one. Come on. So. For the video. Uh, I really appreciated getting to listen to you as well, Kathy. And I just want to thank you for the invitation to do this. Um, I've done things like this publicly, but never collaboratively like this. So it's a lot of fun for me to do it. Um, does anybody have any questions? I can speak to technical stuff or anything, really. Yes? Did you choose the sort of substrate to match the mummy color? Is it no, and that's a good question, actually. I wasn't that thoughtful, and I usually am not. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm working on, uh, it's called a burnt umber brown. So in painting, there are things called earth colors, uh, browns and reds and yellows. Um, and it's a very traditional kind of logical process to paint, starting with those and then slowly getting to color. It is the complete opposite of what I normally do in my studio practice. Um, but for the sake of this, it seems this would expedite things a little bit. So that's why I'm, I'm on that brown, um, just to have something kind of neutral so that the color, you can see the color pops. You don't need a lot of color for it to pop. So yeah, great question. I'm sorry I wasn't able to watch the slides. Oh, no problem. Um, <laughs> it was an interesting experience as well because um, I normally paint from photographs that I take um, and I typically do take photographs with the intention of them serving that purpose. So it was a little interesting to take and work from Kathy's photographs. I, she showed me a lot of, I think it was last week we met and flipped through a lot of stuff. I said, send me as many photographs as you can. And I tried to pull photographs that would most effectively serve uh, this purpose where um, 
the, the structure of the faces or the heads was a little clearer, um, usually maybe more with a singular or stronger light source so that if, if I can see the structure, it's a lot easier for me to paint from than if I can't. So I have something to be responsive to. So I think I kept the floor clean. <laughs> yes? Is it oil paint or? No, and that's the other thing that's a tad awkward for me. Um, this, these are acrylic paints, and so typically I paint like this a lot when I'm demonstrating techniques for my beginning painting classes, and that's traditionally done with oils, um, and you can manipulate the oils a little bit. Um, and this is acrylic, so it dries a little more quickly, which you know you can adjust to. I mean, there are merits to doing working in that way as well. Um, but I'm, I'm used to mixing colors as I go along, and I, and. Of course, that slows down the process. So, for the sake of this, I pre-mixed a lot of colors, which you know it's hard to be responsive in some ways when you have things pre-mixed. Um, so it was a, you know kind of an interesting uh, experience to do this with acrylics. I of course work with acrylics in my own studio, um, but I would not choose acrylics to work in this manner if I if I had a choice that was you know outside of this context. It's a good question. Oils probably smell and smell the solvent and probably some of the, the oils in the paint. Which so, yeah. Go ahead. Do you have a plan of where you're gonna go from here? Or we're gonna add more heads. More heads. That is the plan. <laughs> Do I have a, a constructed layout of things? No. Um, the intention was I was gonna start with a head and then move to another head and then move to another head. I don't know how that aligns or misaligns with what Kathy's vision may have been um, and that's, that is more the way I tend to work. I don't tend to do a lot of studies and, and lay things out. I kind of just move from one thing to another to another and then try to resolve that as, as it comes along. Yeah? What will you do with it when it's done? I'm going to uh, give it to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think, I, I, I if you know. still want it. I mean, if she doesn't, then... Uh, and who knows where it could go to the Salon des Refusés or the Island of the Lost Toys or something. That, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you, you like it, I, I'm very happy to. I'm not worthy. Oh, of course you are. Yeah, this is all from you. I mean, this is, this is uh, emanating from your experiences and, and the work you put into this. So I'm just here for the ride. I'll for sure send a photo of it to Scott Cairns, so who will be very surprised. <laughs> People were watching a live. Uh, painting of his <laughs> I, I do, of course, prefer painting from light. So if he's ever here um, and he'd care to sit, that would be kind of cool. He's in Washington State, okay. so it's a stretch, but we'll see. Right. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming. I couldn't see what I was doing. I was too close.